it, it's been an interesting, interesting day, um, say the least. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to be here and, and I apologize for starting right on time. I normally like to start a little bit early. I do have, I, I, I think I've got a good presentation together, but part of, part of what was skewing this, this more, but I've been working on this presentation is the fact that I worked on a project um, with a client down in Corpus and uh, this on Saturday, uh, he needed some help. And I went down there and it was like, holy crap, I should talk about this on this webinar that I'm doing. <laughs> so um, I've modified the presentation a bit from what I was going yeah. to do to what we got. How are you doing? Great, great. No, I, I've I've been there, done that. You know, two, three days before a presentation, I'll catch something else and like, oh man, I need to incorporate that. And I'll start incorporating it and realize, ooh, a couple of my slides are wrong even. I need to go change those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm great. Cannot complain whatsoever. Um and, and as always, it it's uh you feel free to handle it however you want. Of, of course, I'll interject. I'll, I'll try to keep it as polite as possible and wait for those natural pauses. A, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, just in case there are any new folks on the webinar today. Um, Brett Dillon is our speaker. Uh, he, he's quite literally forgotten more about building science than I will likely ever know, which is fine with me because my brain is about full as it is anyway. And and fantasy football season is coming and, and I've got to clog it up with all of that worthless information. Um, but today it's something I'm really passionate about. And frankly, the reality of it is, is HVAC contractors in Texas are allowed to use rules of thumb. They, they just matter of factly are. Uh, I don't know if you caught our webinar last week where I covered ACA's residential system design review form. Um, for all the code officials on the call, if you really want to affect change in the industry and get a better HVAC system for the citizens in your jurisdiction, there is no better way than to require ACA manuals JS and D. In other words, the load sized right, the equipment selected correctly, and the ducts installed correctly. And, and that's really the only way to do it. Um, in this one page form that you could take at permit, now granted, it, you do need your manual J attached to it and your duct distribution sketch attached to it. But if I encourage any of you that aren't requiring this to start, and this wouldn't be some sort of new energy code requirement. This has been in the mechanical chapter of IRC for 30 plus years. Um, now, 30 years ago, when windows were terrible and our homes were randomly leaky, probably seven to 10 ACH on average, but we had no idea, right? And we didn't do as good a job of sealing our ducts. Well, that five to 600 square foot per ton probably worked fine 30 years ago. Well, you know, all of y'all know that we've been on the 2015 energy code for five years now, and the 2021 will be coming, will be coming sooner rather than later. And as our building thermal envelope just gets better and better and better, and we insist in the HVAC contracting industry to still use rules of thumb, you know, 19 out of 20 HVAC contractors, the, the only ones that don't are the ones doing in work the jurisdictions uh, that enforce it. So I'm assuming we're gonna talk about that, but I don't wanna steal Brett's thunder. Oh, the last of the uh, housekeeping though, after the webinar, you will get a course evaluation from Kathy uh, simply fill out the course evaluation and I will get you your ICC CEUs. Uh, with that, Brett, the floor is yours. Uh, looking forward to it and take it away, sir. All right. Now if I can get my tech, other technology to work, um, this will be amazing. Um, right. We're seeing it. Looks good. There we go. Um, so a little bit about why people should listen to me. Uh, it's, sometimes I, I just start off and it's like, well, you really should tell them why you, why they should pay attention. Um, so I was a former builder, uh, got into building science um, as a builder. And one of the things that, that really got me was 
um, I realized I knew more about HVAC than the HVAC contractors did. They were doing the work for me. And, and I thought this is a problem. And I ended up working at South Face Energy Institute and then some other places and just further developing my skills. But it's a point now where um, ACCA hired me to, to produce a training program for them and on uh, residential system installation verification. And then I was um, hired by NATE, the North American Technician Excellence uh, Organization to produce a training program for HVAC verifiers to go out and do verification work. So uh, I know a lot about this. I Don't ask me to install an HVAC system. I just know how they're supposed to be installed and the design side, what's supposed to happen, and on the verification side, how you make sure that it happened. And then in between on the installation side, I leave that to the technicians and folks like that. So don't ask me how to wire up an HVAC system. I have no idea. Ask me how to test it to make sure that it's been installed correctly. Know that in spades. Uh, so first thing I want to talk about is so what's in the code. And I'm not going to hit everything that's in the code for HVAC systems. I'm just going to hit what I think are like the really important ones when we're dealing with energy um, and affordability and sustainability and those kinds of issues. So the first thing is what's in the energy code. And all of these references that you see are from the 2018 um, IRC and IECC. Um, but these things have been in the code ever since Texas adopted a code back in 2006. They've been in the code a lot longer than that. Um, it's just that's when Texas decided to adopt a code. Um, and there, every version of the code, for the most part, these things are in there. The new things have been programmable thermostats. That's now a mandatory requirement. I think it went mandatory in like the 2009 or 2012 code. Um, outdoor heat thermostats for heat pumps, that's been mandatory for a long time. Uh, the R8 supply and return. That's been mandatory since like the 2009 code. And Texas had this weird thing where, you know, if you installed a 14 seer air conditioner, you could drop it down to R6 because we didn't have a lot of R8 around. But now R8 is just, you know, common as house mice. Um, duct sealing is mandatory. That came out um, quite a long time ago. The duct leakage testing, which the testing is now mandatory, that's been a fairly recent development in the codes. Um, and the duct leakage test results. Uh, that's part of the prescriptive path. Um, and you got to remember there's multiple paths to energy code compliance. There's the prescriptive path. There's two versions of the um, UA approach. Uh, one of them is the UA total and one of them is, is slightly different. Um, and then there's a cost performance path, which is comparing the house that was built um, or the house that was designed, because it's as designed, not as built, the house that was designed with the code reference home and as long as the house that was designed costs less in energy um, over the year than the, than the reference home based on the code requirements, uh, the house wins. And then there's the energy rating index path. And I think we've talked about some of these before. Um, uh, building cavities not used as ducts, that's mandatory. Uh, it's been kind of in the code for a long time, but it, it was worded very strangely. So things would happen and things would not happen. And equipment sizing and efficiency ratings, that's been mandatory for a really, really long time in the code. Uh, and in the mechanical code, of course, there's some things that cross over the duct ceiling, uh, equipment sizing and efficiency ratings. Those are all crossovers in both the energy codes and the mechanical codes. The duct design in accordance with ACA Manual D, they prefer ACCA, but I keep calling them ACA. Apologies if you're listening. Um, the duct design in accordance with ACCA Manual D, that's been in the mechanical code for a long time. Duct supported in accordance with manufacturer's installation instructions, that's been in the code for a really long time. And this one's fairly new that the return and transfer openings have to be sized in accordance with manufacturer's installation instructions, Manual D, or by a registered design professional. That one's fairly new, but we've had um, things in the code on return ducts specifically uh, related to heat pumps. Um, but that kind of language has been in the code for a really long time and it's always been part of manual D. Uh, so the way I designed this presentation, uh, it was a, a new trip for me. So we've been doing this for 39 years. I can't tell you the number of times when I'm out with a client, a home builder or an energy rater or a utility 
or code officials and the HVAC contractors there and, and they, they fold their arms and they look at me and they go, well, we've been doing this for 39 years and we've never had any complaints. And I have to say, the fact that you've been doing something wrong for a really, really long time does not make it right. It makes you stupid. So, you know, and, it, and, I, and I get away with saying things and I'll tell you a story later about a very specific picture in the slide. I get away with saying stuff like that too. But I got a curly mustache and now I've got a curly mustache in one leg. So maybe that's what I, I can get away with doing. But um, I call them on it. You know, just to, for the fact that you've been doing something wrong for a long time doesn't make it right. It just means you've been doing something wrong for a really long time. And now all of a sudden it's coming to the forefront. And, and I spent, I spent my Saturday morning in an apartment complex down in Corpus Christi because Friday afternoon I had uh, a guy call me and he said, listen, the builder of this apartment complex, and this guy's from El Paso. Builder from the apartment complex uh, has been a client of his on other projects, um, never down in Corpus, and called and said that they're having problems with ducks sweating in the mid floors between the apartment units. And he wants me to come in and, and see what I can do and, and everything. And, and, you know, so he started to pick in my brain. And I said, listen, I can, I'll, I'll be down there Saturday morning and I'll help you out. So I got up real early, went down there Saturday morning. So this was kind of fresh on my mind and the things that I saw were just horrific um, and the, and thank God nobody's moved into it yet but there's going to be a lot of drywall torn out a lot of stuff has to go on before this this apartment complex can be lived in you know and that's what happens so one of the first things I'd like to talk about that that a lot of things slide under the radar and it's the outdoor thermostats for heat pump. Now, this is a mandatory requirement. It's been in the code for a really long time. But most HVAC contractors don't know that on a heat pump, you can set that outdoor thermostat so that the, um, the electric resistance heat kicks in when the heat pump can't meet the load. It's not 40 degrees. Sometimes it's 12 degrees like it is at my house. In fact, um, my heat pump that I have installed at my house, my house has got a lot of stuff wrong with it, but there's a lot of stuff right. My heat pump can handle the load, the winter load on my house, the heating load, all the way down until it gets 12 degrees outside before the electric resistance heat has to kick in. Now, what is it set at? 40 friggin' degrees. Why? Because the HVAC contractors apparently have never seen this sheet that comes out of the, from the manufacturer and it comes out in the, all the documentation that they get um, whenever they want to install a unit. They could a whole bunch of manufacturers data to help them do the job right. Balance point worksheets is one of them, but they've never seen it. At least that's what they tell me. They didn't know these things existed. And it's pretty simple. Uh, the way this, this works is you've got lines across the bottom. That's your degrees. And then up one side, you're going to have lines that are the load. And you basically just take a ruler, set where the load is on the one end, on the vertical axis, and then where the, the, um, the capacity of the system is on the lines that you see there, and where those intersect, that tells you what temperature to set the outdoor thermostat at. It's not complicated. You need a ruler, you need to be able to read a chart, and you need a pen or a pencil. Wow, and you need to I just learned something paper. already. You know, I, I knew I knew there had to be a lockout to prevent the strip heat from coming on when the heat pump could handle the load, but I didn't. I, I just thought it was an on-off. I thought it was a kind of it, it sensed when it could, but it's actually a setting that needs to be adjusted. Yeah, they can just adjust it to to fit, and it's like this is why they do this. So if the system can handle it, you don't have to kick on the strip heat. Because it's yeah, really not a lot worse than trying to heat your house with a with a hair dryer. Right. I, I remember doing an HVAC change out inspection in Granbury and, and I walk in, the lady's got it on emergency heat. And I said, well, why do you have your, your strip heat on? And you go, oh, the HVAC contractor said it heat better that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I actually gave a presentation for a utility company um, 
for all the for they have a program with rebates and stuff for HVAC systems. So I gave this pro this training program. It was a morning. Uh, the HVAC company or the utility company paid for breakfast, paid for lunch, and you know it's this morning session for all the HVAC contractors who wanted to participate in our program. And one of the first things that I brought up was, hey, you know these outdoor thermostats for heat pumps. It was an electric co-op, so heat pumps are big. You know here's how they work. And but before I, I got into how they work, I said, so how many of you guys here know how to set the outdoor thermostat? And they all raised their hand. I said, okay, what do you set it at? And everybody said 40 degrees. And I was like, all right, let me show you how it's supposed to work. They had no idea this sheet even existed. And I said, the manufacturers give it to you for a reason. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, it's like, give me a break. Um, but it's like, okay. And then what happened afterwards, because I followed up with the utility. Afterwards, they said that the HVAC contractors, because the utility was requiring this, the HVAC contractors were offering the builders more money back as a discount than what they would get as a rebate from the utility if they would just let them keep doing what they're doing. You know, that doesn't surprise me. How Now, that's not going to be super simple for an inspector to check that that balance point was set correctly. I mean, you're removing panels and getting to a thermostat, or is it yeah. fairly easy? It, no, it, it's, it's a little more complicated, but what I, I just say, can you show me your balance point worksheet? There you go. There you go. Because at least then they, I can see, did they at least do that? You know? No, and that, might that's great. Yeah, doctor, and, at least that. If they yeah, didn't do and, that, and, then you know they didn't do it. Yeah, and that should be required. Hey, prior to that, that would be, again, on my laundry list of things if I ever fall off the wagon and become a building official again. Hey, on your heat pump install, let me get your balance point set point before you can schedule your CO inspection. Just so, because once you get the contractors aware of this and doing it correctly, it's easy to do. You just got to get them aware of it and doing it correctly, right? Yeah, pretty much. Although I ran into an interesting, I gave the, a training presentation in, in Laredo one time. And, and I, I was like, one of the weirdest things ever. Um, I don't know, I, I, I've already said the jurisdiction's name, so I might as well just go all the way in on it. Um, and this was a few years ago, so I'm sure things have changed. This was quite a few years ago. I'm sure things have changed since then. Um, but I was teaching this class in, not this one, but a, a different class on, on HVAC systems you know, what's code and then what's beyond code. And so I had one of the mechanical inspectors was there in class. And I said, you know, this stuff's required in the code. And he goes, but they don't do that. I said, okay, what's your job? And he said, I'm the code inspector. I said, okay. And I go on to the next thing. And I said, and, they, and here's what the code requires them to do. And he goes, they don't do that either. I said, well, what's your job? And he goes, I'm, I'm the code inspector. I said, okay. <laughs> We're going to the next thing. And they said, they don't do that either. And I said, what is your job? And he said, I'm the code inspector. And I said, so you're code enforcement, not code encouragement, right? That's so great. I, I have a like, training in Laredo on the 24th. And I'm going to make sure and bring up this balance point because that's new to me. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad at least somebody learned something. Um, duct sealing has been mandatory forever. What kills me? And it just absolutely frosts me. Is if you look at what the code says they're supposed to seal, it's the longitudinal and transverse joints, the seams and connections. That's what they're supposed to seal. What do we find? They seal the shit out of the insulation, not the longitudinal and transverse joints and the seams and the connections. I'll see a ton of mastic on the insulation. And when I see a ton of mastic on the insulation, I go, right. Where's my pocket? And I'll open it up, and there's usually maybe a zip tie, or in this case, absolutely nothing. And I go, okay. So they didn't do what was required. And I mean, the easiest thing in the world, pocket knife. Slice open. You're not going to cause any damage that can't easily be fixed. Slice open the mastic. Take a look at the actual connection that they were supposed to seal. What do you see? Yeah, well, I mean, and, uh, it blows uh, my mind. Yeah, 
and, and odds are that that even if they have to trim off a few inches of flex to to re-establish that connection, they almost always leave it a foot or two too long anyway, and it needs to be a straight a foot or long. two. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm being generous. I, I had one duct run. I mean, flex that comes out of the box, 25 feet long. I had one duct run. It was eight feet, and they used the full 25 foot length, and it was just snaking along. And so I asked the guy, you know, what what, what happened there? I said, oh, we used the uh, we used the full length so that we could have sound control on the, on this supply duct. And I said, sound control? Hmm? Well, I did a really good job of air control, too, because we ain't got none coming out. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh come gosh. on. Um, cut, cut it to fit. It works. Um, the equipment sizing and efficiency rating, this is another mandatory requirement. And it says it has to be sized in accordance with ACA Manual S. Sorry. Sorry, ACCA. ACCA Manual S on loads that are calculated according to manual J. Under the 2018 code, there's two exceptions. Again, this is in the 2018 code. If they're using a multi-stage or variable refrigerant flow and the loads are calculated within the range of published capacity, that's one exception. The other one is if the specified equipment uh, published capacities cannot satisfy the total and sensible heat gains and the next larger standard size is specified. Not two sizes, not three sizes up, the next larger standard size. So. The funny thing is, uh, it seems like HVAC contractors don't do this. Because what I see a lot of is they use the AHRI certificate. And they say, here's the capacity of the equipment. And if they do have a load calculation done, they match it that way. They size it based on the AHRI certificate. Or they select it based on the AHRI certificate. So I'm going to share some information about AHRI. I, I did this presentation, this little section. I did a presentation similar to this friggin' 2009, 2008, and people seem to be stunned. So get ready. I've overlaid the AHRI region map with the code map. And you can see they do not line up. <laughs> not even close. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to the AHRI region map, but that's what it looks like. Wow. And then we have this. The AHRI data that is published that's on those certificates is for region four, Washington, DC. These are the temperatures for that capacity when it was tested in Washington, DC or likely Arlington, Virginia, because that's where HRI's headquarters is. 80 degrees Fahrenheit indoor cooling test, 67 degree indoor wet bulb, 90 degree outdoor temperature, 47 degree outdoor heating test temperature, and a 17 degree outdoor heating test temperatures. Those are the test temperatures that they use. But those are the indoor conditions. Now, outside of me, in the summer, who keeps their house at 80 degrees? Uh, nobody I know. No, I get an argument 78. The that's it. Uh, in the wintertime, nobody should be keeping their house at 80 degrees. <laughs> um, there's no reason for that. But these are unrealistic test conditions, even for Arlington, Virginia, right? But these are the this is where the data comes from. So when I started looking at at like what are the code requirements, these are the code requirements: manuals J, manuals S, manual D. If you look at manual J, manual J is all about doing the load calculation so that you can have a, a sense of the heating and cooling loads that then get plugged into manual J so you can, or to manual S, so you can select the correct perf, uh, piece of equipment to meet the demand. And it gets plugged into manual D so that you can get the HVAC duct system designed so that it can deliver the right amount of BTUs to take care of the load. And so, you know, it starts off with these code requirements and then here's all the stuff that goes into it. And then we look at manual J. Manual J uses the 99% and 1% design temperatures. So 99% of the time, it's cooler than that temperature for that location. 1% of the time, it's colder than that temperature. So that means that 99% of the time, the HVAC equipment is oversized by manual J. It's a room by room load calculation, not a block load. And manual J is a process, not software. 
I have a lot of guys tell me, oh, I've got, I did a manual J. I said, really? And I said, what'd you use? And they pull up some software that ACCA has never approved is complying with manual J. They, they, they say, well, here's what it did. I found it on the internet. And I'm like, okay, you know, bonjour. You're from France now. You know, it's like, give me a break. Um, manual J is a process. It, it, it's, a, it's actually a physical manual. It's a big, big, bloody book. And I, I've read it um, so many times the covers fell off and the spine's gone wonky. But it's, it's, it's a process. If you don't know the actual process, then the software inputs, you might as well be a monkey sitting at a typewriter punching keys and hoping, you know, war and peace pops out. It's not going to work. It's a process. You have to know the process before you can use the software because the software doesn't always follow the process. Even software approved by ACCA doesn't always follow the process. So you have to know. When do you have to do a workaround with this particular software tool? Because it does not follow the process. It spits out a bad answer. So these are the kinds of things that happen. And, and I got into an argument one time, not an argument, it was a discussion mostly uh, at their end. Uh, I had an HVAC distributor call me up because we'd rejected a load calculation for one of their contractors. And it turns out the contractor didn't do the load calculation, the distributor did. Should always have the guy who, who's selling you the piece of equipment um, tell you what size, you know, how big of a piece of equipment you need, I guess. That's a good business model for one of them. But he called me up and he was, he was cussing me out because we rejected the load calc. And I said, hold on a minute. The reason we rejected the load calculation is because the house that was in the load calculation does not match the house that is being built. The, the square footages are all off. The surface areas are all off. And he said, you can't expect my guys to know how to do that. To calculate areas when you're doing a load calculation, it's kind of the job description because surface areas is one of the required elements to do this. You can't, and then, and then so he started arguing with me some more. I said, hold on a minute. Do you have Manual J? Have you read Manual J? And he said, we got a copy in the office. I said, that's great. Have you read it? And he said, well, we've got a copy in the office. I said, no, no, no. The question is simple. Have you read manual j and he said no and i said okay read manual j then call me back and you can argue all you want and i'll listen to you but until you read manual j i'm not listening to you your guys didn't do their job they should be required to do that then he started going on about you know, how hard it is to find quality people and all the rest of that I'm like whatever i get it but still if you hire somebody to do a job they should be at least competent in doing that job Right, you wouldn't hire. Well, I was gonna say you wouldn't hire a clown to do something, but I wouldn't hire a clown anyway. I got a kid that's scared of them. Um, so Manual J looks at the indoor design temperatures, the outdoor design temperatures, windows, surface areas, walls, surface areas, ceilings, surface areas, floors, surface areas. It looks at the infiltration. It looks at the appliance load. It looks at the occupants. It looks at the ducts. It looks at the ventilation. Manual J looks at all of these things based on the design of the house, the blueprints of the house, and the construction specifications, things like that. Now, when it comes to infiltration, here's what the code requires in the 2018 IRC. You know, climate zones one and two, five ACH50, climate zones three through eight, three ACH50. So when they plug in seven ACH50 for their infiltration rate, I go, so you're saying that the house is going to be built worse than is legally allowed. Okay, let's try a different number. They go six ACH 50. No, no, no. <laughs> let's pick a number that meets the worst house for infiltration, the worst that they can legally get away with. Like if you're worse than this, you can't get your certificate. Let's look at that one, right? Well, you, you know what I found annoying on this, Brett, with the software, right? Soft, elite, it's all the same. It, it's like nine different submenus to actually get in there and enter the CFM or ACH. The default is always tight, semi-tight, moderately tight. And how in the world do you know what those mean? Yeah, you'll know what those mean if you read Manual J. That's the crazy bit. Um, Manual J actually gives the range of, of air changes for those different things. But again, since we know exactly, like we could plug in blower door numbers. If we have blower door numbers, we can plug those in. Um, I did a bunch of work for a builder one time where we just averaged their blower door test results for this plan. And we said, plug this into your, 
into your load calculation. You know, here's the average test results. We can plug in, we know the code requires, it's, it's, it's written in the code book. Plug that in is the worst house they can legally get away with for infiltration. But the software guys don't make that easy because they've never had to before, right? Enough users demand it. They'll go, oh yeah, well, that makes sense. Let's plug that in. And I yeah. think Elite's doing a better job these days. I think they're, they make it slightly easier, but you're right. It's a pain in the neck in, in other parts of the anatomy to, to navigate through some of these software tools. Uh, they, they weren't designed to be used by the insulation contractor to do the load calculation for the HVAC contractor, which is happening. And uh, there's a huge chunk of East Texas where uh, one of the larger HV, uh, insulation companies is doing all the load calculations for the HV, about 17 HVAC contractors because they don't know how to do them. And I asked the guy who does those for the insulation company, I said, did you ever go to a class on Manual J? From, and he said, no, I just got the software and figured it out. <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah. Um, you know, the more I talk about this, the more that whiskey on my desk looks inviting. Um, <laughs> and then it comes to internal loads. Um, for appliances, Manual J basically has three settings. You've got 1200 BTUs per hour. Um, so that's not very detailed. It's like a chunk load that's usually stored in the kitchen laundry area. Um, and then you 2400 BTUs per hour. So that's for a bigger house. And again, usually it's kitchen laundry area and then 3,600 BTUs per hour. Again, it's a bigger house. Um, and that's and the guidance they give is in manual J, you know, use this load if the house is like this size, use this load if it's this size. It's based on the square footage, I think, and, and number of bedrooms, because that gives you a nice sense of how many times people are gonna be doing laundry, that kind of thing. Um, and then the occupants, manual J has always had number of bedrooms plus one, because you always assume there are two people in the, in the master. Um, their ACCA has been kind of backing off on this a little bit, um, not in their manuals, but in, um, in some of their programs, they say if they have one extra person in the house, that's not a big deal. It's not a deal killer because it's only 230 BTUs per hour. You know? So they give some kind of, you know, ACCA gives some soft guidance on, you know, if you've got a three bedroom house, it should have four people in the, in the manual J load calculation. But if they have five, it's not bad. At least you got a load calculation and it's close. Um, so um, that's the internal loads that get looked at. And then the duct loads, it looks at the location of the duct load. Uh, where the, what are the ducts running through? Conditioned space, unconditioned space, hot attics, crawl spaces, basements, you know, you name it. And then what's the duct leakage rate? And again, you should look at like, what's the code maximum? You know, what is the, what is the code, the maximum the code allows? And, you know, in the 2018 code, it's 4%. So you can plug that in. And if you don't know how to do the math, it's 4 CFM for every 100 square foot of conditioned space. So 4% of the conditioned floor area. So the conditioned floor area times 0 0.04, give you the number, plug that in for duct leakage. Um, and, and, and you can run with, with that. Um, but then there's the duct work and you've got R8. Um, that's pretty standard just about everywhere. There's a few jurisdictions that are still seeing a lot of R6, but um, R8, it's pretty simple. And the ceiling, you know, how well sealed was it? These are all things that get looked at in manual J. And here's a, a form that I, I brought up years ago. I was at the 2007 ResNet conference in San Diego. And I'm sitting in the class and a guy's teaching the class and I'm about five rows deep. And the guy's teaching the class on HVAC design and everything else. And then he said what I thought was the most stupidest thing I'd ever heard. He actually stood there in front of a room, about 150 people and said, there's no way to tell whether a house was actually, you know, whether an HVAC system was actually designed according to manual J. And I couldn't help it. I was Johnny jump up and I, I jumped to my feet. And I said, I couldn't restrain myself. Pardon uh, everybody's ears for the profanity you're about to hear. I said, that's bullshit at the top of my lungs. ACCA produced a sheet for code officials to go through and check off whether they followed the process or not. It's available from ACCA for free. 
come on. This is in 2007, and an HVAC quote unquote expert was out there saying there was no way to really evaluate whether a system had been designed. He had no idea this thing even existed. So I sat back down again. I tried to calm down. And then about five minutes later, he said another stupid thing, and I was jumped up again. And then shortly after that, ACCA started talking to me about doing work for him. So I guess it worked out in my favor. Um, when it comes to equipment selection, uh, they look at the, the heating output and the BTUs per hour, and you're trying to get the heating to be less than or equal to 140% of the load. So they already build in, not only is it oversized 99% of the time, but they have this allowable margin of, of excess capacity because you're never gonna find a system that delivers exactly what the load calls for. Um, so for heating and cooling, they give you these kinds of variances. And you have to look at the sensible capacity, the latent capacity and the air handler, um, cubic feet per minute, what's the airflow through the air handler. And you also have to look at the auxiliary heating that, put it, that got put in. I can't tell you the number of times, they don't tell me at all what, the, what kind of heat strip they put in for auxiliary heating on heat pumps. What size is it? It's never marked. I'm like, how am I supposed to know? I'm, I'm supposed to verify that this system conforms. How am I supposed to know if I don't, you know, so we have to chase the HVAC guy down and go, oh, I always put in 8KW, or I always put in, you know, 5KW. One guy said, I always put in two banks of, of tens. I'm like, well, what did the load call for? <laughs> you know, that's like, you know, there's, there's actually some math you can do, some science about this. And then there's a manual S equipment selection worksheet. Um, I built this one myself off of ACCA's documents. I just cleaned it up a bit um, for some work that we were doing with some other clients. And basically it's like, what does the load calculation say? That's the left-hand side. What does the manufacturer's performance data at design conditions say? That's the right-hand side. And then you find a system that meets the design and all those boxes on the right-hand side match the design, or you can be slightly over or slightly under. But it makes it pretty easy to go, this system does not work, or this system will work. This coil combination will be awesome. So this problem down in Corpus found out that all the indoor units, the air handlers, are two and a half ton air handlers. The outdoor units might be a one and a half ton outdoor coil, or it might be a two ton outdoor coil, depending on the size of the apartment. How big is the square footage? There was no manual S done. Um, the manufacturer came out and said, there's too much airflow going across the coil, so we need to, you know, going through the system so we need to damper it down so they they put some um, <laughs> the way they described it they didn't use dampers the way they described it is we inserted some blocks to reduce the amount of airflow going through the system so that it would spend more time on the coil to dehumidify because the humidity in these these apartments that are drywalled and painted and finished and ready for people to move in is pushing 70 some percent. Could they not have slowed the fan down or was it already on the lowest speed? Well, it was on the lowest speed they could, that they said, it's on the low state, the lowest speed we can get for the two and a half ton system and it's still too much. Which is like, okay, well replace the friggin' air handler, right? The air, <laughs> it's the wrong size to begin with. Let's replace that, yep. you know, but instead they decided to, to try to slow the air down by putting blocks in um which only creates more problems and and then kind of like the the other big thing is um you know they probably could have fiddled with the dip switches to get it past the manufacturer setting for for the lowest speed um you know i've worked with hvac contractors before on some equipment and we were able to get it slowed down another 400 cfm um, on this one system and we had to do that because it was a new home that was being built. And we knew that there was this unfinished attic area that the homeowner would do it themselves. We knew that was going to happen. But so me and the HVAC contractor designed a system for that. 
because we knew the homeowner was going to finish it out himself and then they're going to call and complain that the HVAC system didn't work. So um, all that happened and we were able to just ramp up the dip switches and get it back to the speed because I did two load calculations. I said, well, let's get this piece of equipment, slow it down to this, and then it'll satisfy the load when the guy finishes out in a very crappy way, which he did. And so everything worked. But, you know, it's just some, you know, that HVAC contractor was a rarity. You know, he knew he was in trouble and yeah. he didn't want to be in trouble. And he knew that he could reach out to somebody and get help. Yeah. Um, so when that call came, it was literally an hour. I spent an hour at the, at the kitchen table walking them through what we had done while Jimmy ran around getting everything back to exactly what we wanted it to be. And, um, and then that extra duct run that he had that he capped off, he got access to it through an attic knee wall access point and um, that the builder had put in and uh, connected it, cut in a, a duct boot. And I would spend an hour at the table and then we walked around with the homeowner for 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes, everything was right as rain. They were very happy. So the message is though, you have to use the manufacturer's performance data. Do not rely on the AHRI certificate data. The AHRI certificate data is good for this thing and this one thing only. This coil works with that coil. That's it. That's the only thing the AHRI certificate is good for. The loads, the, the capacities are completely useless. Yet that seems to be what everybody's using to select the equipment. And it is completely useless. There's an entire process that they can go through interpolating between the, the manufacturers um, in the manufacturer's data tables. They can interpolate between the temperatures that, that are given to get the design temperature for your location. And you can figure out exactly the capacity that you need at design conditions for your location because they do it in like five degree increments. So, you know, it it's just requires a little bit of math and you're good to go. So duct design in accordance with ACCA Manual D, again, it's required. It implies that a room by room load calculation has to be done because you can't do a Manual D on a block load. Um, and you look at the, the cubic feet per minute, what's the airflow? And then you look at the sensible heat ratio, um, which is how much of the heat is sensible versus latent. And then you look at the, the Delta T um, between the temperature drop across the coil between supply and return and the sensible load. All of these things go into sizing the ducts correctly and then getting the correct duct design so that you can maintain um, the right friction rate because you get a pressure drop as the, from the friction of the duct as the air moves through the duct. The pressures get lower and you get less airflow. So this is why you should have duct systems that are well designed typically get downsized the longer they go, the pipe gets smaller so that they can keep the velocity up so they can get the right amount of air out, um, among other things. But it's it's pretty it's not hard to do. I their software, a lot of the load calculation software has add-on modules where you can literally drop in the blueprint, sketch out the duct design, and it'll tell you, you know, like, oh, this needs to be this, you know, from the load calculation. Here's how much air you need to deliver. And then you can work out through their, they've got a system that you can work out what size, you know, here's all the devices and all the, the structure of the duct system between this point and that point, how do we make that work? Um, and it tells you everything you need to, to do and, and you can walk through that way. Again, it's not complicated, but if you haven't read manual D, you're not gonna know how to do that to software. You're gonna be just punching keys on the keyboard until you get something that you think is right. And then the unfortunate thing is this often happens that if they have done a manual D, the design goes out with the installation crew and they throw it away because every room gets a eight inch duct run, except for the half bath that gets a six and the master gets a 10. And I can't tell you the number of times I've been in meetings with builders trying to solve homeowner comfort problems. And I find out that's how the HVAC system design got implemented. So it got thrown away. And some guy who's never designed an HVAC system in his life is walking around going, this room gets a six, this room gets an eight, this room gets a, a 10 or two eights. Um, and, and all of the HVAC design work just went out the window. And it's just, it's, it's like, my God, if I was that incompetent at doing my job, I, I wouldn't have any customers and I'd probably be in jail. It sure would because be nice if, if, 
if Manuel D had a little, and, and I've been, I've talked to Wes Davis and uh, David Bixby at ACCA about this, just there, there's not, there's a hundred thousand different ways to do a duct system per manual D. And, yep. and for instance, I, I think one of my pet peeves is the teeny tiny plenums because evidently duct boards made out of gold. So we put these <laughs> teeny tiny supply plenums on there and have takeoffs immediately after the piece of equipment. But as far as the black and white of manual D, 18 inches from the end plate is the yep. only prohibited area. Everything else is could conceivably be designed per manual D. And, and it's just for a code official, if you don't have a, a sketch like on your previous slide, I don't know how you verify that it's done right in the field. So oddly enough, ACCA has a, a sheet to help code officials um, at least get a document from the HVAC guy saying, hey, I did the math, and here's what we came up with. Um, and, and, it's, it's, and it's something that code officials could actually quite easily fill out themselves if they wanted to, um, but you know, they're overworked like everybody else trying to keep up with this insanity. Um, but if you see this, you know they didn't do it. You know, this is just like horrible. You can't do flex duct like this. You can't bend it 90 degrees and then have it punch through an eye joist where the insulation gets compressed and expect it to do anything. You know, that's just bad. And then the, on the other side, you've got one duct coming in and it's a certain size and it connects to a T fitting. It, well, it turns a 90 degree elbow and not even an elbow. They just bent it and poked it through, um, through an eye joist to connect to a T that wasn't really a T. They, fabricated it on site um, by shoving one, cutting a hole in the duct and shoving it in there and then taping all the insulation up real nice. Um, and what do you get? Uh, one duct of equal size coming off of that. So now you've got a certain volume of air moving through, you know, let's say a, a 10 inch diameter duct. And then all of a sudden, you still have a 10 inch diameter duct with that volume of air moving through it, but now it's two 10 inch diameter ducts. Well, the volume of air moving through that is gonna be a lot less, the velocity is gonna be a lot lower and you're not gonna get very much air coming out at the end. You know? If you see this, you just go, that doesn't look right. If you know, if you've read manual J, right? If, or manual D, you know. So it's like, hmm, you know? what's going on there um but it's not the code officials job to read manual d it's the hvac contractor's job to read manual d maybe you just ask do you have a copy of manual d can i see it did you do this um that would probably be a good start but you can always just look at the installation and go that doesn't fit um that doesn't fit manual d and by the way the Energy Star program, all of their HVAC design stuff that's in there for HVAC system, system selection, and load calculations, all the rest of it, it follows ACCA manuals J, S, and D. So, you know, if it's an Energy Star home and it's been verified correctly, you know it complies. So, if it hasn't been verified correctly and it still looks like this, then um, you need to give me a shout so we can track down the guy that was doing the rating and say, dude, that's not. That's not the way the program works. Um, or this one. God, I couldn't believe this. Um, you can't bend flex duct like this and expect air to flow through it. It just doesn't work. Or this one. Uh, this one was interesting. And I, I'd be curious about your perspective on this one because what they did was they had, um, the HVAC contractor came in and roughed in. This is the uh, return. This is basically where the return grill is going. Um, it's a. It's going to be a massive return grill. Um, return grill is going, um, and then it connects at the top. There's a chase that punches down through the top of this. But along the way, the plumber decided that, that he was going to run his PEX lines right through this. Uh, this return duct, and then his gas line right through this return duct. 
Oh yeah, that, that's allowed by code. Return plenums, you, you can have gas lines and water lines and plastics and all that stuff in there. That's just so terrible. So I saw a house down in um, South Padre Island that I got into the attic and I looked in the mid floor and, and I thought, this something just seems weird because I can see where the return duct run is but I also know there's a toilet over there. I don't see any plumbing lines right here where I think that toilet should be. So I um, opened up the return grill and I snaked a camera down in there and right in the return was the plumbing drain for the toilet it was right in there. And then the pipe ran down for a little bit and it exited out the side. <laughs> I thought, my God in heaven, what happens when that pipe fails and they end up with a sewage leak inside the return grill, a return duct? This is going to be a nightmare and a half. Mm -hmm. But again, we see it all the time. And I, I was looking at ducts that were no better than this on Saturday morning. Um, things like this, where they just jam it through and bend it and it's flex. It's flexible. It's supposed to be that way, right? So that's what they do. They put it in that way. And it's like, no, it should be treated like, you know, BVM. It's, it's sacred. And again, more of the same. But this time, though, I got a good picture of the exhaust fan in the bathroom because the exhaust fan was installed by the electricians and the ducts are run by the HVAC guys. So here's the electrician doesn't care which way the port points, the exhaust port. And the HVAC guy doesn't bother to flip it around. He just does this. How much air do you think is going to get exhausted out of that exhaust fan? A solid six to eight CFM. Yeah. That's about what we see. And under the Energy Star program, they're required to be tested, but not so under the codes right now. And we look at this and go, this is just a bad deal. You know? Yeah. Right. This is just... It, it causes increased humidity in the bathrooms, which leads to mold growth, which leads to building decay and health problems. Everything the code was designed to prevent. But this one was one of my favorite ones. I have no idea why the HVAC guy ran the duct that way. Hmm. Because the room, so the right-hand joist cavity is where the, the floor is where the floor register is. But the room extended on over the one where the, it's bent, over the plumbing pipe. He could have put it in there. He could have put it five feet back. There's all kinds of different ways he could have done it, but this is the way he chose to do it. And, and I think it's because he cut the hole in the floor first and then figured out how to run the duct. Instead of looking like, how do I run the duct and then cutting a hole there? And the ducts have to be supported in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions. We still see this. Again, that's like supported every five feet with a strap or a saddle. No sags, no compression, no kinks. And yet, what do we see all the time? We see this all the time. Unless it's an Energy Star, it's not allowed under Energy Star. But again, if you see this and it's supposed to be an Energy Star home, you should give a shout out because that tells us that the energy rater is not doing their job. So you're talking about the last 18 inches of mm -hmm. the uh, duct plenum is not supposed to have any takeoffs. Yeah. That's where this HVAC contractor, the guy in the middle, he decided that's where all of them had to be. Right. Well, hey, I like at least he's got a couple of feet before his first one. He at least did something right. And they're all off <laughs> the side except for the one feet in the J box at the back. That's interesting. Oh yeah. Gosh. Yeah. But the problem we, is yeah. though, these terrible systems, as long as they're two to three tons oversized, and, I mean, it can still keep a homeowner comfortable at a horrible energy penalty and humidity penalty. And they've got to keep their house 70 to be comfortable instead of 75 and a litany of other issues, but ultimately they're still comfortable. And so we can't change the industry yet. It's, it drives me crazy. Yeah. And that's what they tell me. That's why they tell me we haven't had any complaints. And I go, okay. Um, 
Well, you're going to because the houses are going to start rotting down. The people are going to find out. And worse, the lawyers are going to find out. And when the lawyers find out about this, holy crapola, you know, there's going to be some folks going out of business because they can't afford the insurance. And, you know, and I've told builders before, my job is to keep the lawyers out of your bank account. That's my job. That's what I try to do. If you do what I say, we'll keep the lawyers away. That's a good mantra. I should probably write that down. Yeah, you need to write um, that down. <laughs> you know, if you do what I say, you'll keep the lawyers away. And, and it seems like the only time anything changes in this industry is when we have these massive lawsuits and everybody freaks out and they tighten everything up. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, how many houses are underperforming or are facing structural failure because of the lumber rotting or the mold growth is just in crazy in the house and the people are sick and they've got high, high medical bills? Um, how much of that do we have to put up with? When you could simply do what the code asks you to do, know your job and do your job well. And this is in the hands of the code officials. Make sure that the guys doing this work in their jurisdictions know what they're doing. You wouldn't let a framer frame a house crazy. It would cause the house to collapse. You wouldn't let a plumber say, hey, you know what? I only want to pressure test one in seven. Make sure I don't have leaks in one in seven. You wouldn't let him do that. You wouldn't let an electrician put light switches in the shower. Well, actually, that did happen in another jurisdiction. But, but, but it's, it's something you, you should think about. HVAC isn't just the thing for comfort. It's the thing for affordability, which is the number one first thing in the line for the intent of the code yeah. and, and structural and with, safety. And, and with tighter homes with better building thermal envelopes that we've had for the last handful of years, these problems are going, the, the lawyers will be involved sooner rather than later, because especially down in the Corpus, Houston, Beaumont, we're having problems left and right because of this type of insult. Yeah. And, and the, I know the lawyers are getting involved because I've been working for some of them and, you know, trying to figure out what the most likely cause is. And, and I, I had one, one guy was working for the, the opposition. It was a big engineering firm. And he said that the duct system in this house was the best sealed he'd ever seen. And I said, that's interesting because you can't actually see how well the duct system was sealed because all you looked at was the insulation. The ceiling is supposed to take place on the inside where I looked. And here's what you get. Yeah. That's a quick way to win a case. I mean, it's just, I could go on and on. I won't. You guys have been out in the field. You've seen the damage. How about this one? Return and transfer openings have to be sized in accordance with manufacturer's installation instructions manual D or a registered design professional. So here's some general rules that come out of manual D for uh, return grills and return uh, and returns in general. You want the airflow going across the coil on the return side at about 350 feet per minute, which means you need to have a big return duct, a bigger return plenum than you have on the supply side. Um, and the face velocity at the return register, you need it about 400 feet per minute or less. And you want a 90 degree bend in if you can get it um, because it reduces the amount of noise. Uh, but for heat pumps though, just as an idea, this is, this is a good sort of equation to use, is they need to have at least six square inches per thousand BTUs per hour of capacity um, of return duct area, cross-sectional area. So again, that, on a two-ton unit, you're talking about a 14-inch duct. What do we usually see? A 10 or a 12. And the way it gets to be a 10 or a 12 is because they might have a gigantic grill, but the smallest hole is what sets the return flow. And so in this case right here, 
we had a gigantic return grill. It was it was about it was custom. It was about six feet long. And I'm out there looking at it, and I'm going to the HVAC contractor. Your return is too small. So this is for a, a four-ton unit, and this was the first floor system. They had a four-ton unit on the first floor, and it's the air handlers up in the attic. I said the return's too small. And he goes, look at the size of this thing. Look at the grill. Look at how big this is. What do you mean it's too small? It's enormous. I said, yeah, but look at the smallest hole between that wide open grill and the return side of the air handler. That's not big enough. And he goes, that doesn't matter. It's about the size of the grill. And so hmm. it occurred to me right then and there that I have a fantastic opportunity. Fantastic. Never, once in a lifetime. I can do a real life demonstration of how come he's wrong, why he's wrong, and why that smallest hole theory works. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I want you to open your mouth as big as you can, as big as you can, and breathe. So he opens his mouth real wide and he breathes. I said, okay, now I'm going to put my hands around your neck. And I did this very slowly. I said, I'm put my hands around your neck. And so I got a thumb on each side of his windpipe and I started pressing my thumbs together. And I said, as he starts gagging and choking, I said, now, does it matter how big your mouth is or does it matter how big your windpipe is? And then I let go and he goes, it's the windpipe, the windpipe, that's what matters most. And I said, you got it, fantastic. I'm glad you learned this lesson. Now, how do we make this a bigger windpipe? The guys that were with me were started laughing because they'd never seen an HVAC contractor willingly get choked and throttled for doing something stupid on a job site. And again, like I said, I get away with things because I got a curly mustache. I'm really nice about it. I do it in a joking way. I bring a lot of humor to it. But then I try to make the lesson real. And, and that HVAC contractor never forgot that lesson. Every time I ran into him, he was always, it's the windpipe, dude. It's the windpipe. Yep, it's the windpipe. And it reminds me of something that was in the Code of Hammurabi, which is the oldest known building code that's ever been written. Hammurabi was a Babylonian uh, emperor, laid down sort of like the first kind of laws um, that were recorded. And when they translated the cuneiforms, uh, they found a section that was interesting because it said uh, code language with mandatory enforcement. And it said things like, if a builder builds a house and the house is not strong and the house falls down and kills the homeowner, that builder shall be slain. So we had sort of like a parameter for safety. It was like, you know, proof that your work wasn't good, it fell down and there was injury, somebody died. The penalty, mandatory enforcement shall be death. And and I keep thinking about this and thinking about this and thinking about this. Because when I gave this training presentation to code officials one time, and it was just code officials in the room, I said, when you see this slide, how many builders did you just think of that you'd like to just take out into the parking lot? How many HVAC contractors? Now, we can't kill them today, and we shouldn't but we can make sure that they don't do this again. It's in your hands to do that. You have the power to say, you know what? This house is not getting a CO until you fix this. You know what? This is in the code. You have to meet these. This is the worst you can legally get away with. And you didn't do that. It's not continuing. And start holding the ground because as the as the building tightness increases, as the building thermal envelope gets better and better and better through code requirements, through advanced building programs like Energy Star, through all of these things that are happening, builders that want to build better homes, homeowners that demand better homes, as all of these things happen and keep happening, the HVAC systems have to catch up. They have to be as good or better than the systems that are going into the shell. And yet we don't find that. 
we still find and ACCA struggles with how can we how can we get this out to the industry that they need to do this. And every time we come around, it's like, well, the only people who have any kind of like power, godlike powers over the HVAC industry are the code officials, the building inspectors. They're the only ones. And I was at one jurisdiction and they told me what happens when they do crack down on the HVAC contractors. So the HVAC contractors call a friend of theirs over at City Hall and that guy comes running over and gives my boss an earful. No, my boss comes walking down the hallway and tells me, give it a green tag. And I said, that's great. Have them do this. Write me a letter. Have them, have them do this. Have them write you a letter that says that you will continue to collect your paycheck, your pension plan, whatever you got. You collect your benefits, all of that for not doing your job. But they're willing to pay you to not do your job. Have them put that in writing. And if they're not willing to do that, then you say, well, I guess I got hired by the city to do my job. And then you go out and you do your job. And, and just code officials on the call. I, so returns are, especially in jurisdictions that aren't really doing much enforcement on this, returns are notoriously undersized. It's, in my opinion, it's hard to oversize one. And, and well, in reality, you, you're not going to see oversized. And, and, and to me, again, add it to the long list of requirements. Say you're in a jurisdiction and you know, and Brett just mentioned it, your city manager or your supervisor, you don't, you frankly don't have the political gravitas to enforce the full manual JS and D and totally create a paradigm shift in the industry. I understand that. I understand you've got a mortgage to pay and if you get fired and don't get a paycheck, you can't pay your mortgage and that's a problem. So I totally understand that. However, you can require, you can get your HVAC contractors to at least meet you in the middle. Hey, let me get a return in every bedroom at least, as well as the main one in the hallway. And, oh no, it, it, the we'll use the door undercuts. Well, if, if you look at manual D, for instance, a, a 300, a, a master bedroom with a decent sized master closet and master bathroom, I mean, you might need 300 CFM to that area. Your door undercut per manual D for 300 CFM is 4.7 inches. Who wants five inches cut off their master bedroom door? And, and I was lucky when I was a building official in Granbury, all the HVAC contractors there, I got a return in every bedroom. A lot of times two returns in the master, a return in every secondary bedroom. And I had a lot of times two main returns on each end of the house. Now granted these were 4,000 square foot homes, but what, what are your thoughts, Brett, on, now granted, I, I, Dealing with the reality of I can't get a JS and D, I'm just not going to politically be able to make that happen. What are your thoughts on worrying about an oversized return or having too much return versus too little? Well, the the reality is you can never have an oversized return ever. It'll never happen. I agree. Thank you. you. Never happen. You can never have too many returns, uh, but you sure as hell can have not enough and then have them too small. And the small return destroys the performance of the HVAC system. And it's one of these hidden things, right? So people don't think about that. They, they look at the grill and they go, that's a big return grill. They got a lot of return. Reality is, it isn't the grill that matters. It doesn't matter how big the mouth is. It matters how big the windpipe is. Well, yeah, and back to your back to your supply house selling the equipment. A perfect example, a jurisdiction that I won't name, but a two thousand square foot, three bedroom, two bath starter home. You know, just a five ton unit. Luckily, it only luckily they didn't seal any of the liners. They just um, mastic the the insulation. So. 
and and that didn't require testing. So that that three tons oversized unit with a one 16 inch return on, on a five ton. So a grossly undersized return with three tons oversized with really leaky ducts came together to make that house work. But I, I can just imagine being the salesman at the supply house telling the HVAC contractor, oh, this 2000 square foot house. Oh man, this five ton will work perfect. Oh yeah, here, you need a 16 inch return just there in the hallway. And boom, you just sold a five ton instead of a two ton. Yeah. And, and it yeah. works. That calamity of errors would work to keep the people comfortable, but at all sorts of penalties. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, the crazy thing is, is when I look at, you know, what is the intent of the code, it's hard to find comfort in there. I find affordability. I find energy. I find structural safety. I find human health. But it's hard to go, you know what? The fact that they're comfortable overrides all the other stuff. When I look at, you know, what I know high moisture does, long exposure, high moisture, you know, when you get high humidity levels in a house, I know what that does to the structural integrity of that home. I've been in way too many houses years after they were built to know that that's a good thing. And, and we are seeing a rash of multifamily buildings going into failure before the occupants move in. We're seeing a rash of new homes that the attorneys are getting involved in because of this. And, and we're seeing them not just along the coast, we're seeing them inland as well. It's gonna hit us first along the coast because that's where the humidity is the highest. Um, but we're gonna see a lot more of it. And, and it just, you know, I'm sitting there looking, you know, this builder had gone out, I mean, they had gone to build a, a decent affordable housing product in this multifamily complex down in Corpus. And, and this is what they got. And, and I asked my client, who's the energy rater on this? Because they're getting energy ratings done. Who's the energy rater on this? And they said, I don't know, they've got one, but they haven't seen him. Yeah. And I'm like, well, when you find out who that bastard's name is, let me know. Yeah, no, you, you see it all the time, unfortunately. It's just... I joke all the time, the easiest way to pass your duct leakage and blower door test is from the bar stool at happy hour. You don't even have to get up. All you got to do is fill out the form and email the city. Voila, you passed. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm working on changing that. But yeah, well, look, I was at the end of the presentation. Questions? Um, well, and we'll cover just for those of you that are on the webinar. I think I scheduled this for an hour and a half. And, and if not, when I turn it into ICC, I'll get you an, an hour and a half worth of CEUs. Um, definitely want that balance point slide. I'm going to steal that for you and, and add that to all my presentations going forward. Um, let's see. What, do you, what are your thoughts on now the code says building cavities cannot be used as ducts or plenums. But what are your thoughts on an upflow air handler installed in a closet to where they're using effectively that building cavity underneath the unit as a return plenum? To me, I always, to me, and always it's funny, they all there's always like old Coke cups and and you know an old Sonic bag in there and just dust and dirt and all that and heaven forbid anybody clean that area out before they throw a filter on the grill and and seal it up, but if they line that with the duct board and mastic it up would 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 that would that then transfer from a building cavity or, or what are your thoughts on that 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 situation where you've got an upflow unit in a hallway as a return plenum for a return plenum. Uh, well, you're exactly right. You turn that uh, frame cavity into a duct by okay. lining it with duct board and sealing it with duct mastic. And I even, you know, I even, you know, if it's on concrete slab, put duct board over that. Um, and shiny side in, 
seal it with duct mastic. That's what I've that's what I've been advising people. I was just curious to get your interpretation of that. Yeah, that's that's the only way you can make those things work because the minute you don't do that, they leak like a sieve when we test them. So, yeah. so this was what was funny. Well, not really funny, you know. So this apartment complex I was at did blower door tests on some of the units that didn't have mold growing in them. Seven and a half ACH fifty. It's what they were blowing. Yeah, that's did duct leakage test. Not required because hey, the ducts are all inside the building enclosure in these first floor units. Um leaking well over a hundred and some CFM, like 150 plus CFM. On a little apartment. And, and, the, and it's like, well, I think we figured out why we get condensation on the ducts up there, an oversized system, leaking a hundred and some CFM into an enclosed cavity. Yeah. With high humidity because the, the exterior shell is leaky as hell and you're in corpus. Yeah, yeah. And you couldn't change it, couldn't talk them into swapping out the air handlers and doing it right. So they put some sort of jerry-rigged intr intrusions into the airflow. That's just, I, I had one project grossly oversized. Their, their solution was they installed inline uh, electric resistance heaters in the supply ducts to bring the temperature down because it was too cold. Yeah. That was a solution. Just, yeah. It just boggles the mind. You know, every time you think, I've seen everything, along comes some cat that comes up with a new idea that you'd never thought would ever happen in a gazillion years. It would never reach the realm of human possibility that they would even consider doing this. And then there they go and they do it. And you just go, okay, I've got another one for the photo collection. Yeah, you know? I know, right? And and then you, and then you know, the thing that really bothers me though, is in this case, the code officials are relying on an energy raider mm -hmm. to do his friggin' job, mm -hmm. and they haven't. That yeah. is unconscionable. No, it, it is. You're relying on a third-party inspector to do something, and they don't do it. You know, so when I find that. When I get the name of that guy, I'm gonna let the code guys down in Corpus know, and you know what they do with it's up to them. None of my business after that point. Um, complaining to Resnet doesn't work. No. But, well, you know. if I'm, I'm pretty good friends with the building official there, so I can probably affect some change at least get that guy a, a, a talking to, if if nothing else. But. Uh, it's, I, I'm actually, I just submitted a proposal to DOE um, to hopefully that includes a brand new duct blaster and blower door for me. And I'm engaging with cities right now to do just some, some random kind of ninja style QAQC of their third party providers, you know, just, just kind of off the record, not, you know, not. Just, just kind of alerting cities when they have bad actors in the rating business. Because unfortunately, I mean, it's like anything, you know, 85, 90% of the folks in the business, whether it be police officer or teacher or energy code rater, you know, 90, uh, the vast majority of them are fine folks, but I understand, you know, I mean, my wife just lost her job and hadn't worked in a year and a half to COVID and I've got an option to pick up a new builder who needs to make sure that he passed his blower door and duct blaster test on the first time every time or I'm fired. I've got a heck of an incentive to make sure he passes his duct blaster or blower door test first time. You know what I mean? And, and, and I don't, there's not a perfect solution to that. I mean, ideally, ResNet would do a better job of QAQC, but that's not, that doesn't do them any good you know what i mean i mean get getting rid of people that are paying them money because they're doing mediocre work that's not good for their bottom line and, and there's no 
I don't know if you have any great answers on QA, QC, any kind of brainstorming on, on, a, on a good way to, to make sure that these folks like the guy in Corpus are doing their job a little better. Yeah, I, I've got a lot of ideas. I've written a lot of papers over the years on quality control in, in the energy rating industry um, and how things could work better, work with the code officials to make sure that, um, you know, the guys that are not doing what they should be doing or are, are, are basically either tuned up or turned out. Right. Um, I, I know that there's, I know there's a lot of work to be done because um, I've been working on it for three years yeah. and I know what we're going to do uh, at some point we'll be able to talk about it, but uh, we're working on, we're working on some initiatives that'll transform that whole side of things. So. Well, certainly any way I can help you out along those lines, let me know. I've, I've been, I've talking, I've talked with one of the, the larger Raider companies in the Dallas Fort Worth area. That's kind of frustrated by this and, and, and their idea that he had, they actually called me and like, man, you know what we need to do? We need, you're an independent third party that's just out to save energy. What about you, QA, QC? And, and, and I was like, oh yeah, that'd be great. You know, I'd be happy to. Um, but it's, anyway, I, I don't, there's not a great answer, but happy to, to help you out with that any way I can going forward. And just so you know, in, in the infinite universe theory, there is certainly a monkey right now finishing War and Peace. That, that's almost a, a guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we know it's it's going to happen. All right. Laws of probability. Um, it's yeah. inevitable. Well, Brett, thanks so much. As always, the, I, I enjoy the conversation as much more so than the presentation. Um, and I, and I, know, I know you are a bourbon guy, and I've, I've got a handful of good bottles in my cantina in my backyard. So next time you're in San Antonio, let me buy you one. Um, and if you don't mind sending me a PDF of your slides, I'll send a PDF of the slides to all the attendees. And I'll also send, um, I have some basic mechanical code guidance and, and, you know, about the undersized returns. And there's a bunch of hyperlinks for additional resources. And the Energy Star HVAC checklist is fantastic. Give that to your HVAC contractors. Again, that ACAD residential system design review form, everybody should be requiring that for all new single family construction. Political uh, powers be what they may, but I'm, once we get the industry changed, it will be changed for the good for forever. And, and the, the good HVAC contractors will be begging the jurisdictions to get everybody else on board as well. You know, it's amazing once, once you make folks start doing it right, when they have competition that's cutting corners. I, I, when I was a building official, I had more complaints from plumbers about other plumbers than anybody else. Because if, yep. you know, if you're a contractor and you're doing it by code and your competition's not and saving some money, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll quickly get the industry itself on your side. If we can just actually create a paradigm shift and, and come to that tipping point where the majority of HVAC contractors are doing JS and D correctly. And I mean, y'all, y'all have been on webinars with Alex Meany with RightSoft. The software does 90% of it for you. If you're willing to put a little bit of thought and a little bit of effort into it, this, it's not. It is rocket science, but the software does the calculations of the rocket science. All you have to do is, is, is have a, a general idea of what you're doing. I mean, it's just, it doesn't seem all that difficult. Now, granted, I'm like Brett. Don't ask me to install your HVAC system. Ask me to inspect it. Um, but it, it, I just get a feeling it's just not that hard to do it right. But unfortunately, the vast majority of the industry doesn't. Brad, I'll give you the parting word and we'll call it a day. All I could say is, you know, go out there and do the job the best that you can do. And if you're a code official, then a building inspector, then that job is making sure that the trades that were hired by the builder to do their job, do their jobs well. And, and if you get the political pressure, I get it. I've been there. Uh, you get the political pressure to, 
to back off. I made different choices. Um, I just told them, put it in writing. I'll be happy to get paid and not do my job. And they backed off. Um, but it may not work in your, in your situation. I understand that, you know, it's just the line has to be drawn somewhere. Do what you can. It's a game of, it's a game of centimeters at this point to get incremental change into place, get what you can get to move forward. And once you gain that ground, get some more and move forward. And then once you gain that ground, get some more and move forward. There are some times it requires drastic measures. There are some guys out there that are just doing stuff that's flat out dangerous. And you should probably step in and stop them. But there's other things. It's like, we can work on this and get them to start adjusting and changing over time. We'll end up with the houses that are performing the way they should, homeowners that aren't sick, houses that aren't rotting down, energy efficiency. We'll end up with all of that. We've got to start somewhere. We'll never get it if all we do is sit around on our butts dreaming about it. Yep. Try to get a little better every month, folks. Try to get a little better every day. We can't just keep doing it the same way we've always done it. I told you I'd give you the last word, and there I am running my mouth. Thanks for joining <laughs> us, everybody. Uh, thanks again, Brett, so much. I really appreciate it. Always learn something, and I will be still in that balance point slide and incorporating that into my list of knowledge moving forward. Y'all, everybody go ahead and take the rest of the day off. Hit happy hour. Tell your boss I said it was okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.